Good morning and welcome to worship with Titusville United Methodist Church on this fifth Sunday in Lent. Uh, we continue our spiritual disciplines, um, looking at spiritual disciplines uh, each Sunday throughout Lent and today we are looking at worship. So we are so glad you are worshiping with us today. A couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, we are continuing our Lenten mission of purchasing ShopRite gift cards um, to donate to a local food distribution ministry uh, through April 11th. So we would love for you to uh, get in on that Lenten mission and contribute so that we can uh, help families in our area uh, stay fed and nourished. You can um, do that by sending a check into the church with a line, uh, a memo on the line saying food mission, uh, or you can give online, but if you do that, please make sure to let us know by email or phone uh, how much of your uh, gift you would like to go towards the food mission. Some more exciting news, I mentioned this last week, but we will be reopening the sanctuary for worship uh, next Sunday, that is March 28th, Palm Sunday, and we are so excited to be able to be worshiping together in person. Um, we ask that you do pre-register for that service, uh, for that service as well as for our Easter Sunday services. And that is just uh, because it is our first Sunday back and it is also uh, a big celebration in the Christian year. Um, we want to make sure that we have enough space for everybody who wants to come. Uh, so please let us know. There is a Google form in uh, our e-newsletter as well as on our website where you can sign up. 
or you can simply call the church phone number and leave a voicemail. Let us know how many people will be attending on Palm Sunday, that's at 10 a.m., our usual service time, and which service you would like to attend on Easter Sunday. We will have a 9 a.m. service and an 11 a.m. service, so let us know which one you'd like to come to and how many people will be attending. We will also be having a sunrise service on Easter Sunday at Washington Crossing State Park with uh, our Catholic and Presbyterian brothers and sisters, um, and that will be um, at 6.30 a.m. Additionally, we have two more uh, opportunities to come together for worship on, uh, during Holy Week. On Holy Thursday, um, that is Thursday, April 1st, we will be having a time of conversational worship online via Zoom at 7 p.m. and the link is in our e-newsletter. Um, and then on Good Friday, we will be coming together with some local United Methodist churches at Pennington UMC. Um, and we will be having a contemplative service uh, where we feature the music of Taizé, a monastic community in France. And that is a really, if you've never been to a Taizé service before, I highly recommend coming. It's a very different and meaningful and deep experience. Um, and that is how we can honor, uh, honor Christ together in worship on Good Friday. That's at 5 p.m. outdoors, Pennington, UMC. Last but not least, before we get started, uh, tonight, that is Sunday, March 21st at 7 p.m., we will be having a watch party for our youth uh, where we watch some worship together and have uh, online and have some conversation together. Uh, if you did not get the link for that and you would like it, please let me know. Um, I have shared that link with the, our youth and I hope to see many of you there. Friends, if you have worshipped with us before, you will know that we say every week, you are loved and you are enough. This is a message that doesn't get old. It's a message that we need to hear over and over again. When the world tells us that we are not enough, that we need to do the next thing, achieve the next thing, to be worthy, to be loved, to be cared for, when we say these things to ourselves, God says, no, you are loved and you are enough, just as you are. We hope that you can rest in that message as we enter into a time of worship together today. Gary will be leading us in the call to worship today. Please join me responsibly in the call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We come before you this day, O God, with many thoughts and feelings. Come unto me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden. We come to worship knowing that you are with us in all things and at all times. Let us worship then the God of our hope and salvation. Our opening song is Come Now is the Time to Worship.
Let us bring our confessions to God now in prayer. God of glory, we confess to you today that sometimes we try to limit you. We limit you to Sunday morning, or to the church building, or to a certain time of day, or certain activity. When we do, we do not recognize you for who you are, God of all creation, all times, and all places. We do not give you all the glory that is yours. We admit that we sometimes judge the ways others worship you. We think we have the only way. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for the harm we have caused to others, for the love we have failed to give. Broaden our perspectives that we might learn to worship you in every single thing we do. Amen. Please use this time to bring your own confessions to God in silent prayer. Friends, be assured that the God who is worthy of all praise loves you and has sent Jesus to be with and for you, so that with him your sins were put to death, and with him you are raised to new life. In the name of Jesus Christ, praise God, we are forgiven. Friends, it is as forgiven and reconciled people that we remind each other of the peace we have attained in our Lord Jesus Christ. At, uh, here at Titusville UMC, we have been practicing sign language for several months now, uh, nearly a year, I'd say. Um, and we do that as a way to share the peace that does not require touching. Um, and we also do that as a way to include those who communicate differently um, and non-verbally. So uh, it, I will teach again for those who may be new and um, have not been with us uh, as we uh, have, have learned how to do this in the past. So we put one hand in front of us horizontally and the other hand in front of us vertically. And then we twist and go down. And that means peace. Peace. And then bring both fists together with thumbs on top. That means with. Be with. And then we look into the eye of someone, of the person we are wishing peace. Uh, in this case, I'm looking into the camera and I can feel you looking back at me and we point to them with our thumb tucked in, um, and that indicates you. So all together, that is peace be with you, and also with you. Friends, each week we carve out some time to be in prayer with and for one another because we know God calls us into, into prayer. God calls us to bring our concerns, our struggles, our sorrows, and our joys and gratitude to Him. So uh, in obedience, we join in prayer together today. If you have any prayer requests that you would like for us to include in uh, our prayers next week, Please comment here on the YouTube video or reach out to our certified lay servant, Pat, and she compiles a list every week that goes out uh, that we are in prayer over throughout the week. Today we will be praying uh, for, particularly for our Asian American and Asian friends uh, in, who are living in the United States uh, who have been rocked uh, by the tragedy of the shooting in Georgia, in Atlanta. And we, uh, as we lift them up in prayer, I want you to know that there is a special um, 
time of prayer set aside for them this afternoon by our district, the Capital District uh, of the United Methodist Church here in New Jersey at 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, on Zoom. And the link for that time of prayer uh, for our Asian American and Asian friends um, went out in today's, uh, in the newsletter this week, the e-newsletter. So I encourage you to join in for that time of prayer and solidarity. Um, let us now join together in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give thanks to you for this day. We give thanks that we can come to you with the heaviness of our hearts and with the joy that we experience too. We thank you that we do not need to filter ourselves for you, but that you, in choosing to be in human solidarity with us, have chosen to bear the fullness of our emotions, our concerns, our struggles. Lord, we lift up to you today the Asian American and Asian communities, particularly who live in the United States, particularly uh, today, Lord, those who live in Atlanta, Georgia, the family and families and friends of those who were killed in the recent shooting in Atlanta. And we pray for the friends and families of all the victims of that shooting, that you will journey with them in their grief, that they will be surrounded by love and a commitment for justice coming from those around them, that they will not be made to feel that their loved ones were killed or injured in vain with no one to care or to notice, but that we may rally around them and take this as a clear indication that we have work to do to make this country a place where all of your children are not judged by the color of their skin or their nationality or their cultural background, God, that this will be a nation where all are valued, affirmed, and celebrated in all of our glorious and beautiful difference. Lord, we pray this has been a tough year um, when it comes to racial injustice, and we pray that you will guide us in the way that is pleasing to you to work for justice, equality, and equity in ways that are clear and tangible. We apologize, we repent for the ways that we have been complacent or apathetic or even actively harmful. God, we pray that you will stir us to renewed resolution to care for your people in this world, especially those who look different from us, whose cultures are different from us, whose abilities and priorities and values are different from us. Lord, we pray for healing. Lord, we pray today for the leaders of our church and our world as they respond to these difficult situations and as they continue to make decisions that will affect so many, uh, that will affect the well-being of so many in all realms of life. God, we pray that you will Fill them with your spirit and guide them in justice and truth and wisdom that they might work for 
the good of all to the best of their ability. And Lord, we know leadership is not easy. And we pray that you will strengthen them and bless them and give them the courage to keep going forward in the ways that they need to and in the ways that you are calling them to. Lord, we bring before you today loved ones and friends and family who are suffering. Some of us are suffering too, God. We are suffering in body and mind and spirit. We lift up to you today, especially Jill Russo, who has been hospitalized and who will be transported to Philadelphia for further care. God, we pray that you will surround Tara and Jack and the whole family as they cope with her hospitalization. We pray that they will know your love and comfort as Jill seeks treatment and that you will bring healing and relief to the whole family and especially to Jill. God, we pray for Jim, Mary's father, my friend Mary's father, in his struggle with cancer. We pray for Mary as she awaits updates about his condition and as, as she is unable to visit him in hospital, Lord, we pray that you'll surround them with your loving care. We pray for my friend Christian and his wife Melissa as they seek treatment for her cervical cancer. Please, God, surround them with strength and comfort and clarity as to how to move forward in this difficult time. Lord, we pray for Debbie Bird's mother, Mary Ann, who has recently been diagnosed with breast cancer. We lift them up as they face the uncertainty of, of this diagnosis and, and how to treat it. And God, we pray that you'll surround them with strength and love and comfort that can only come from you. And we pray also for Mrs. Evans, the teacher at our local school here, diagnosed with breast cancer as well. As she undergoes surgery in the coming days, we pray that she will um, come out on the other side healed or working towards healing. We pray that you will accompany her in this journey and give her a peace of mind as she goes through her surgery and recovery. Lord, we continue to pray for many who, whom we have been praying for for quite some time. We pray for Sharon and Carol. We pray for Jesse, Roland. We, we pray for Bev Crumb's relative, Paul. For Tony Marie. For um, Jennifer's mother-in-law. We pray for April and Lexi and Allison and David and Denise and Mark. For Jeremy and Jim for Stan's niece, for Sherry, for Barbara, and for the Taylor family as they mourn the loss of Karen and Elijah. We continue to pray for Pat and her mother Ruth, and for Bev Crum. Lord, all of these um, are your children and you know their needs better than we ever could. We lift them up to you that you might care for them and that you might show us how we can care for them. Give us your comfort and your healing, O oh God. And God, we are grateful to you for the joys in our lives as well. For 
We are grateful today that uh, Mandy's fractured wrist is finally healed. We praise you for healing. We praise you for the ways that we have been connecting throughout Lent on our Wednesday evening devotionals and for the time of conversation and devotion to you. We praise you for the gifts of those who uh, lead us in worship, for the music, for the spoken word. We pray prayers of gratitude for those who have had birthdays this week. We think of John and Keith and Arlene and Neil, and we thank you for long marriages. We lift up with gratitude the uh, marriage of Arlene and Walt, who are celebrating 70 years of marriage together. We thank you for these amazing witnesses in our lives who show us glimpses of hope and joy in times that otherwise sometimes seem overwhelming. God, we lift all this up to you in trust and faith and hope. We pray that these things in the name of the one you sent to give us new life, Jesus Christ. And we pray today as he taught us to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
Christ shall come with a shout of acclamation. Let it take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall come in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Let's pray to God to illumine our reading and hearing of the scripture. God, we come before you and offer ourselves to you this day in worship. Grant us your holy presence as we listen to your words proclaimed to us in scripture. Help us to hear what it is you are saying to us. Amen. Our scripture reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 through 33. Hear now the word of the Lord. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Several years ago, I went to a church service where a friend was playing the piano. This was during my undergraduate years, and I somehow managed to convince my roommates, who were of a range of religiosity, to come with me. The service was at a massive Pentecostal church. And I have to admit, it was an extremely uncomfortable experience for me. As the pastor prayed and left time for people to speak their own prayers aloud or in silence, an overwhelming wave of whispers surged up from the massive congregation. I was trying to keep an open mind, but to me, this felt eerie. Later in the service, the pastor called people forward to the front for healing. He began to speak in tongues as his associates walked down the line of those who had come forward and touching their foreheads, which prompted many of them to fall to the ground, what they would call being slain in the spirit. I had seen this style of worship on TV, but I had never experienced it in person. My discomfort was amplified by the fact that my friends, some of whom were not practicing Christians, were there with me. They had been uncomfortable too. And as a Christian, I felt compelled to defend and explain this experience of worship, even though it also made me feel uncomfortable. Perhaps you have had a similar experience with a style of worship that makes you uncomfortable. 
that pushes you beyond your limits of what you usually think worship is. For some, just entering a church would create these feelings. And I can only imagine that someone coming from a more charismatic tradition, like the one I just described, might attend a service like ours and feel like it was lacking in energy or spirit, perhaps leaving them to wonder how worshipful it really is. These differences in the ways we worship God, these different styles of worship, might sometimes have us asking, what is real worship? What makes something worshipful? What counts as worship? What is it okay and not okay to do in worship? In our current situation, these questions are amplified by new realities. Online worship really worship? Is it okay to do communion online? Can I worship in my pajamas with a coffee in my hand on my phone laying in bed? The verses we read today from, from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians are written to a church asking some of these very same important questions. The church in Corinth may not have been uh, deliberating whether to do Zoom worship or live stream worship, but they were trying to figure out what their new realities meant for who they were and how they were to conduct themselves faithfully and worshipfully. In particular, the Corinthian church was dealing with the fact that they were of a mixed religious background. Some of them had been Jewish, and they had, some of them were Jewish, not had been, they were Jewish, and they had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah that Israel had been waiting for. Others had practiced state-sanctioned polytheistic religions of the Greco-Roman world, but had come to believe in the good news that Jesus had died and been raised to new life for them. In Paul's letter, we see his response to some of the difficult questions this church was grappling with as a newly formed community of people from different backgrounds, and yet united by their belief in Jesus. Could those who had previously believed in many gods still worship those gods and also follow Jesus at the same time? Could they eat food sacrificed to these gods? What was the difference between, between eating food sacrificed to the Greco-Roman gods and Jewish sacrificial foods? Did they need to stop associating with people who believed in other gods? What did it mean to be a follower of Christ? What could and should worship look like? Paul answers these questions as carefully as he can. He makes a strong connection between the newly formed Christian church and the Jewish people, explaining clearly how they all worship the same God, the one true God. Jesus, himself Jewish, was and is the son of the God of Israel. And the followers of Jesus cannot divorce themselves from the Jewish people. Although the newly formed church can certainly learn from some of the missteps of their spiritual ancestors, especially when it comes to the danger of worshiping idols, that is to say, worshiping anyone or anything other than God. Paul goes on to help this new community, all from different backgrounds, to focus on what unites them, pointing to the practice of communion, the sharing in the body and blood of Christ, where all in the community, regardless of their previous religious background or cultural background, 
find freedom from the weight and burden of sin, where they are freed to live new life in fellowship with God and one another. What does this freedom mean for the way the new community worships in their context, where they are a minority and they still have friends and family who worship other gods? where the very meat they purchase at the market has most likely been sacrificed to other gods. Paul has already made it very clear that worshiping anything or anyone other than God, the one true God, is false worship, is displeasing to God. But the question remains, if being a Christian means being made free in Jesus Christ, what does this freedom mean for how to relate to the world? Paul's answer is nuanced. About midway through 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, All things are lawful, but not all are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you. Here, Paul is saying that freedom in Christ means seeing things as they really are. Food is food. It is a blessing from God, whether or not it has been sacrificed to false gods. In the freedom of Christian life, we don't have to worry that we are doing something wrong in enjoying God's blessing of food. Moreover, we do not have to create a sharp distinction between us and them. We do not have to stop associating with people who believe differently from us. We can go and enjoy table fellowship with them. All this is made possible because of the freedom we have in Jesus. We do not have to accept the false divisions that the world creates to categorize us. Believer, unbeliever, sacrificial food, regular food. We can see it all as part of God's good creation. But that does not mean anything goes. As those who bear witness to the love of God in the world, Paul urges the Corinthians to use their freedom in Christ wisely, paying attention to how their actions affect others. Sure, food is food, and eat what is put in front of you when you go to somebody's home, Paul says. But if the person explicitly says that the food has been offered in sacrifice to other gods, then eating it in front of them, while its sacrificial nature may not mean anything to you, will give your host the wrong impression. We can infer from what is said, perhaps, that it will make the other person think that you are in agreement with and support the sacrifice of food to other gods. Now, all this talk of sacrificing food to gods may seem a little bit foreign to us. If I had to make an analogy for our time, now bear with me, I might look to the way some Christians have questions about whether or not they should read the Harry Potter books or allow their kids to read them. Some worry that these books promote witchcraft instead of Christian faith. I think Paul's answer to the Corinthians would suggest that as people with freedom in Christ, we can see the Harry Potter books for what they are, entertaining works of fiction, and feel free to enjoy them. 
But if someone sits down and explains to us that they are engaging in witchcraft and spells to manipulate people, and then ask if we would like to join a Harry Potter book club with them, we may want to think twice about what our willing participation in that book club would mean to them. We might instead take the invitation as an opportunity to talk about our faith and what it means to us. This Harry Potter example might seem a little silly, but I think it helps to make the point. Our freedom in Christ is real and all-encompassing, but it does not absolve us from the responsibility of thinking about how our actions affect others. After this long exhortation about the details of what the Christians in Corinth can and cannot, should and should not do in their particular context, we arrive at the verses that Gary read for us before the sermon this morning. So, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I, Paul, try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. This is the summary. It's the recap of all that Paul has been saying throughout the 10th chapter of this letter. So what do these sentences mean for us? For the way we worship, the questions we have about worship, what counts and what doesn't count. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. So often our human categories can get in the way of true worship, of giving glory to God in all that we do. We, like the Corinthians, are tempted to say that worship looks like one thing, looks like sitting in a church on Sunday morning, looks like a certain style of music, looks like praying a certain way or reading from a particular translation of the Bible. But Paul says, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. In other words, make everything you do worship. The freedom we have in Christ is not just freedom to attend church on Sunday morning. It is a freedom that enables us to see each and everything we do, each and every moment of our lives, as a gift from God as relating to God, and as an opportunity to give God all the glory. Yes, being in worship with each other on Sunday morning or via online worship is one way to do that. But for worship to truly become a spiritual discipline means for it to be woven into every day of our lives. For us to practice being worshipful in different ways, in ways that are meaningful for us, in the most mundane of activities, like eating and drinking. And then as we do this, with a view to how our lives and actions affect and are perceived by others, our worship, our daily living for the glory of God, becomes not only something between us and God, but becomes a witness to the world around us of who God is and who God is for the world. Paul says that in doing everything for the glory of God and keeping others, others in mind while we do so, we seek not our own advantage, but those of many, but that of many, so that they too may know God's glory, the power of God's love, and the freedom of Christ in their own lives. Friends, as we continue our journey through Lent, practicing spiritual disciplines, 
This week, I encourage you to practice daily the spiritual discipline of worship. There are many different ways to do this. The important part is to do something each day that is worshipful. Whether it's listening to some worship music, going for a walk and appreciating the beauty of God's good creation, or praising God for the blessing of nourishment while you're cooking your dinner, thinking about all the love and care that has gone into growing and raising the food and getting it to your dinner table. Think about creative ways that you can expand what worship is and means to you and try to practice something each and every day so that your whole life may become one long song of praise to the God who in love has given us our very lives and blessed us with the freedom to live them in the light of his glory. Amen. Our song of response today is Canon of Praise, an arrangement, an arrangement of the famous canon in D accompanied by lyrics of praise. The slideshow you will see as the piece plays comes from one of our fellow United Methodist Church, churches here in New Jersey, Audubon UMC. You will see that instead of the lyrics, the words on the screen are responses from that church to the question, what makes you praise God? May both the peace and the answers to this question resonate with you as you think about how each and every day can be filled with moments of worship, big and small.
On this fifth Sunday in Lent, you are encouraged to commit yourselves to the practice of worship. Today's offering is a form of worship to God, a small token of our praise for all that God has given us. I invite you to give your offerings today and this week with a grateful heart. You can do that by mailing a check into the church or by giving online, and the information is on your screen. Let us pray together over the gifts that we give back to God this week. God of every moment, as we seek to give you glory in everything we do, we offer up also our financial gifts to you. We offer up our gifts of time, the use of our spiritual gifts, and our hard work to show our community and the world what a great God you are. Use all these gifts to further your work in the world, to the glory of your name. Amen. service has come to an end, but worship never ends. Friends, no matter what you are facing this week, what you are struggling with, what you are going through, may you know the love and power and freedom of Christ in and through it all. And may your lives be a testament, a witness to the blessing that God has given you and made you to be in the world. Go this week. Worship God in all that you do. In every moment, may your life be a song of praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>